By and large, female serial killers seem to be few and far between. But the story of Leonardo Cianciulli underscores the idea that dangerous insanity knows no gender. Leonardo Cianciulli was born in 1894 in Montella Avellino, in what was at the time known as the Kingdom of Italy. She had a hard life as a child, which led to two separate suicide attempts. And as one could imagine, the events of her childhood would precipitate a deeply troubled adulthood. In 1917, when she was 23, she married a registry office clerk named Raphael Hansardi. Her mother did not approve of this marriage at all, since the family already had plans for her to marry someone else. This was still fairly common in the early 20th century. Leonardo said that when she refused to break off her marriage, her mother put a curse on her, as well as her husband. In 1921, she and her husband moved back to his hometown of Laria Potenza. And just a few years later, in 1927, her husband would be jailed for fraud. A couple years after that, their home was destroyed in the Irpinia earthquake. As a result, they moved several times finally setting down in Correggio, where Leonardo opened up a small shop. She was popular and well-respected in her neighborhood, and it seemed like a life of uncertainty and tragedy was potentially looking brighter. Leonardo had 17 pregnancies during her marriage, which is a lot even for the time. Three of her kids died due to miscarriage. Ten more would die when they were still children. As is understandable, she became very protective of her four surviving children, going to great lengths to ensure their enduring safety. Some of her actions were born out of a less than optimistic visit to a fortune teller, who had told her that she would get married and have children, but that all of them would die young. Another prom reader told her that she saw prison in her right hand and a criminal asylum in the left. Coincidentally, Leonardo Cianciulli also had the misfortune of living in Italy when World War II broke out. In 1939, her oldest son and arguably favorite child, Giuseppe, joined the Royal Italian Army. For a protective mother like Leonardo, this was certainly among the worst of scenarios, and she resolved to protect him no matter what it took. Through some sort of cognitive misfire, she decided that in order to save him, she must resort to human sacrifice. Her first victim was Faustina Setti, a spinster who had come to Leonardo to ask for help finding a husband. Leonardo told her that she'd found a good husband for her in another town called Pola, but implored Setti to not tell anyone about it. She persuaded Setti to write postcards and letters to her friends and relatives in advance which were to be mailed once she arrived in Pola. Faustina Setti came to visit Leonardo one last time before her trip. With her back turned, Chanchuli raised an axe, burying the blade in the back of Setti's head, nearly decapitating her. She dragged the body into a closet and proceeded to cut it up into nine different pieces. Blood was gathered in a basin below, as if the scenario could not get any worse. Her official court statements described in great detail the horrific sequence of events that followed. Chanchuli put the pieces of the body into a pot and added caustic soda, which she had purchased for soap making in her store. After stirring, the body parts broke down and turned into a thick, dark mush that she carried with buckets to a nearby septic. As for the blood, she waited until it coagulated, then dried it out in her oven before mixing it with flour, sugar, chocolate, milk, and eggs. She turned the blood into tea cakes that she then served to neighbors and friends who came to visit. She also said that she ate some herself. 
Some sources also say that Chanchuli received Seti's life savings of 30,000 lira as payment for her relationship arrangement services. And because Faustina had sent everyone letters saying that she was venturing off to another town, nobody was suspicious about her absence. Chanchuli's second victim was Francesca Soavi, who had asked her for assistance in finding a job. Having been promised a job at a school for girls in another town, just like the previous victim, Francesca was persuaded by Leonardo to write postcards to friend and family detailing her plans to move and start working at the school. When she went to visit Leonardo one last time before her trip, Chanchuli gave her drugged wine before brutally killing her with an axe. Francesca's body was also dissolved, and her blood used to make tea cakes. Chanchuli's third and final victim was a widow named Virginia Chachiapo, who was formerly a soprano at La Scala, a famous opera house. Having fallen on hard times, Chachiapo was looking for a job and turned to Chanchuli for help. Leonardo told her that she'd found her a job opportunity as the secretary for a mysterious producer for an entertainment enterprise in Florence. Under strikingly familiar circumstances, Chachiapo was struck down violently with an axe, just like the previous two victims. But instead of dissolving Chachiapo's body, she instead, in effect, melted it down to make soap. In court, Chanchuli explained that once the body parts had broken down, she added a bottle of cologne and boiled the remains into what she described as, quote, some most acceptable creamy soap. She gave the bars of soap to her neighbors and, of course, proceeded to make tea cakes from Chachiapo's blood, which were apparently better than the previous human tea cakes she had made during her trial. Leonardo Chanchuli noted that Virginia was, quote, really sweet. Shortly after her disappearance, Chachiapo's sister-in-law started to become suspicious. A few days prior, she had seen her enter Leonardo Chanchuli's residence, but never saw her leave. Desperate, she went to the police, who opened up an investigation and quickly arrested Leonardo Chanchuli. At first, she did not confess. However, when the police began to suspect that her son had been the murderer, she confessed to the murders to ensure that he wasn't blamed. The subsequent trial would reveal precise, step-by-step details of the murders. John Chuli even went so far as to offer tips on how best to prepare human bodies for consumption. During the trial, Chanchuli remained stoic and composed while she answered questions with seemingly no remorse. In fact, onlookers noted an air of pride in her tone and behavior. Leonardo Chanchuli was found guilty and sentenced to 30 years in prison, as well as three years in a criminal asylum. She died in jail in 1970 at the age of 76. Artifacts from this bizarre case, such as the pot she used to boil her victims, are currently on display at the Criminological Museum in Rome. The bizarre but true story has crossed the social threshold between shock and satire. As a result, the story inspired numerous productions, including a dark comedy entitled Love and Magic in Mama's Kitchen, which had a run on Broadway in 1983. It's October of 1870. You're traveling along the newly opened Kansas Territory in search of a nice place to homestead. As you near an area called Labette, you notice that it's getting late and you're tired. Your back hurts. You're hungry. And off in the distance, you see a nice cabin that says Bender Inn. You set up your horse team in the barn and enter the inn to the welcome of a sweet young lady. 
you ask for a meal and a place to rest for the night. The young man at the counter takes your money, and the same young lady escorts you to the head of the table. An older woman places a big plate of stew in front of you. Then bam, everything goes black. Welcome to the Bender Inn. This might sound like a scene from some horror movie about to be released, but it's actually the true story behind the first family of serial killers, the Benders. After the Civil War in the 1860s, many Americans wanted to open up the Kansas Territory to homesteading, but there was a problem. The Osage Indian tribe called those windy, grassy plains their home. The government relocated the Osage to a reservation in Oklahoma and their route is known as the Osage Trail. In October 1870, a man and his son, John Bender Sr., around 60 years old at the time, believed to be a German immigrant, and John Bender Jr., around 25 at the time, settled in Labette County with four other families. The Benders settled a 160-acre homestead that faced the Osage Trail. Once they built a cabin and a barn, they sent for the mother and daughter to join them. In 1871, Mrs. Elvira Bender, 55 years old, who spoke very little English at the time, and her daughter, Miss Kate Bender, 23 and spoke fluent English, arrived at the cabin in Labette County. John Sr. was described by those around him as a, quote, repulsive, hideous brute, without a redeeming trait, dirty, profane, and ill-tempered. It was generally believed at the time that John Jr. was a half-wit because he had a tendency to laugh at anything. Neighbors said that seeing John Jr. excited brought a grave-robbing hyena to mind. Elvira was notoriously ill-tempered and called a she-devil and a dirty old Dutch crone. Kate stirred up the settlers by not only being pretty, but she was a self-proclaimed healer and psychic. She held seances to speak to the dead, and she openly practiced and gave lectures on spirituality and her ability to cure illnesses, which was not unheard of at the time. However, she did cause quite the scandal when it became known that she was a promoter of free love, which really didn't become popular until the 1960s. But in 1871, it was enough to draw people to the inn to see what all the hype was about. The inn itself was a fairly large one-room cabin. The benders decided to hang a large sheet of canvas to separate the cabin into two parts. The back was their living quarters, and the front housed a small general store, kitchen, and a dining area. The idyllic prairie scene turned grisly in May 1871, when a man's body was found in nearby Drum Creek. His skull was bashed in, and his throat was slit. In February 1872, the bodies of two more men were found nearby with the same gruesome injuries. By the fall of 1872, news of the brutal murders and of several unexplained disappearances had spread far and wide. People were afraid to travel that route, so they avoided it altogether. In early spring of 1873, a man named George Newton Langhorne was traveling from Independence, Kansas to Iowa with his 18-month-old daughter, Mary Ann, when they both disappeared. Soon afterwards, Dr. William Henry York, who had sold horses and the wagon to Lancor, became concerned after the horses and wagon were found abandoned near Fort Scott, Kansas. He set out to find Lancor and Mary Ann. Dr. York followed the homesteading trail to Fort Scott and interviewed folks along the way. At Fort Scott, he positively identified the horses and wagon as the ones he had sold to Langhor. He wanted to return to Independence, but never made it. He decided to stop at the Bender Inn. He was never heard from again. While the Benders seemed to have free reign in their deadly game, they made a big mistake. Dr. York was from a very prominent family. His brothers were Colonel Ed York and State Senator Alexander M. York. Colonel York organized a 75-man search party to track down his brother. 
They ultimately tracked Dr. York to the Bender Inn. In March 1873, Colonel York interviewed the Benders, but they denied all knowledge of the missing man. Within the next few weeks, Colonel York heard rumors that a woman claimed to have barely escaped the inn when Elvira attacked her with a knife. On April 3rd, 1873, Colonel York returned to the Bender Inn with the new accusations. During this second interview, Elvira tried very hard to hide it, but ultimately she blew it by ranting about how the woman had cursed her coffee. After her outburst, Elvira threw Colonel York and his men out. Unfortunately for the Benders, the damage had been done. Around this time, word had been spreading among the homesteaders about the disappearances and mutilated bodies. A meeting calling for search warrants for all properties in the area took place. Pa and John Jr. were at that meeting as well as Colonel York. A few days later, the neighbors noticed that the place seemed to be abandoned and the animals on the Bender farm were dying and starving. An elected town official, Leroy Dick, went to the Bender farm to investigate. He noticed a truly awful odor coming from under a trap door in the house. His call for a search party turned up hundreds of homesteaders armed with pickaxes and shovels. They couldn't begin to guess what horrific scenes awaited them. Under the trap door was a secret room. Blood had clotted and soaked into the stone floor and into the dirt underneath. There were no bodies, however. This made them spread out and search the property. In the area of an orchard and garden, Dr. York's body was found, buried in a shallow grave. By the next day, 10 bodies were recovered as well as a gruesome assortment of body parts. All of the bodies had their skulls bashed in and their throats slit. However, little Mary Ann, Langcourt's 18-month-old daughter, appeared to be buried alive. To make the scene even worse, many of the bodies were described as being indecently mutilated, suggesting some sort of sexual trauma. From what they saw, it soon became clear how the Benders caused the sad demise of so many unsuspecting travelers. The victims would enter the inn and be given a seat at the dinner table over the trap door. Once seated, one of the men would hide behind the canvas and smash the victim's skull with a hammer. Then one of the women would slit the victim's throat and drop them through the trap door into the secret room below. Later, the body would be dismembered or just buried. Any valuables on their persons would be reappropriated by the vendors. But because many of the victims were not wealthy or in possession of valuables, it appeared that they killed more for the sport rather than for the money. There were about a dozen bullet holes in the cabin suggesting that some of the victims tried to fight back. There were few of the Bender's possessions left in the cabin by the time the neighbors came to inspect it. But one thing that had remained was a Bible. At this point, nobody knows who the Benders really were, nor where they went when they abandoned their farm. The Benders seemed to have ridden off into the folklore of Kansas. Senator York and Governor Thomas A. Osborne offered substantial rewards for the capture of the Benders, but to this day, the rewards have never been claimed. As for the Benders, one rumor stated that Ma and Pa fled back to St. Louis, Missouri. Another stated that John Jr. and Kate hitched a ride on the railroad down to an outlaw camp in the Badlands at the border of Texas and New Mexico. A detective claimed that he personally chased John Jr. to the border, but found him dead Some neighbors also claim that John Jr. and Kate were a couple instead of being brother and sister. Actually, neighbors thought they were common-law married because she openly flaunted sexual relations with John Jr. It is also suspected that the only members who were related were the mother and daughter. And it is also thought that none of them were actually named Bender. They were all, however, serial killers. In 1884, a man fitting the description of Pa Bender was arrested in Idaho for killing someone with a hammer. When the Idaho authorities tried to get a description of the wanted man from Kansas, they soon found that the prisoner had cut off his own foot 
and bled to death before a positive identification could be made. In 1889, a mother and daughter, Almira and Sarah Elizabeth, were arrested for larceny in Michigan. They were, of course, accused of being Elvira and Kate Bender, and were sent to Kansas for identification. However, the women were sent back to Michigan when the eyewitness descriptions were horribly inconsistent. It is thought that Elvira is actually Almira Mark from the Adirondack Mountains area, who was rumored to have had many children by different men. It was also rumored that many of her husbands died of head injuries. It is thought that Kate was actually Almira's fifth child, Eliza Griffith. John Sr. is thought to be John Flickinger, an immigrant from either Germany or the Netherlands. While it is true that the Benders never faced justice for their crimes, there were some involved who did. A total of 12 men were charged and convicted of being accessories for the disposal of property stolen off of the Benders' victims. It is thought that the Benders killed a dozen people, including one child. One source even claimed the number of victims was as high as 21. And what of the property today? Near Cherryvale, Kansas, the house still stands as a testament to this horrific tale. Once word spread of all that happened, people immediately flocked to the property, looting everything that they could find. There's a marker that briefly tells the tale of the bloody benders. Hammers thought to be from the home are housed at the Cherryvale Museum. A stained knife thought to be from the house is on display at the Kansas Historical Society. So even through the mists of time, this legend of the untamed West is still very much alive. It is still a joke, apparently, to call two women traveling together, Elvira and Kate Bender. Was Pa Bender the man who bled to death in an Idaho jail? Were the women accused of larceny truly Elvira and Kate? And what really happened to John Jr.? Like so many puzzles from the past, we can only speculate. The year is 1912. Imagine a picturesque, prosperous town in the southwestern corner of Iowa. The town sits up on a gentle hill that the nomadic Native Americans called Pleasant View. The town is Villisca. Thanks in large part to the railroad, Villisca was a hub for commerce, manufacturing, social, and religious ideals in the region. It was an attractive and peaceful town. The surrounding land was made of fertile bottomlands, adding to the tranquility of the scene. Villisca was known for its exquisite churches, exceptional at the time for the variety of denominations welcomed, from Presbyterian to Methodist, Baptist, Christian, Christian Science, Catholic, and Adventist. There were beautiful parks and greenways. The residents enjoyed many civic events throughout the year, and it seemed like an idyllic, thriving small town. But on a dreary, rainy evening in June 1912, the town of Villisca would be changed forever. Residing in Villisca, there was a well-respected businessman named Joe Moore, who ran a local hardware store and a John Deere implement franchise. Joe Moore was well-liked in the community. He was married to Sarah, and they had four children between the ages of five and 11. Now, not everybody was thrilled at Joe's success with his hardware store. Before he opened it, he worked for Frank Jones, also an Iowa State Senator, at the Jones store for many years. The friction came when Joe quit working for Frank and opened up his own store, taking the lucrative John Deere franchise with him. But that wasn't Jones's only issue with Moore. One of the more persistent rumor mills claimed that Joe Moore was carrying on a secret affair with Frank Jones' daughter-in-law, Donna Bentley. Moore was seen on more than one occasion visiting Bentley, who was a teacher in Villisca. But to the non-gossips, the Moores were a happy couple, and Sarah even worked at the Presbyterian Church as a co-director of the Sunday school. 
Her four children were enrolled in the Sunday school. And on June 9th, 1912, they went to the Children's Day service, a celebration of the end of the school year. All six of the Moors went to the church that evening, accompanied by two of the neighbor's children, Lena and Ina Stillinger. As an added bonus, there was a visiting preacher, Reverend George Kelly, teaching at the celebration that night. Along with the other Sunday school children, the Moore and Stillinger children performed their speeches and gave their recitations to the assembled congregation. There was a social afterward, where everyone mingled until about 9.30 p.m. The Moors and the two Stillinger girls walked the three blocks back to the Moors' house to finish the evening off with milk and cookies before bedtime. Lena and Ina Stillinger spent the night with the Moors in the downstairs bedroom off of the parlor. Around 5 a.m. the next morning, the Moors' neighbor, Mary Peckham, went outside in her yard to hang up her laundry on the line. The Moore house seemed unusually quiet. By 7 a.m., Mrs. Peckham noticed that the Moore household, usually a hub of activity, with four boisterous children, was still quiet. Between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m., Mary went to the Moore's porch and knocked on the front door. She noticed that the door was locked from the inside. No response. She went to the backyard and let out the Moore's chickens. She returned to her house and immediately called Joe Moore's brother, Ross. Ross arrived shortly and tried to look in the window, but couldn't see anything. He knocked loudly and shouted to try to rouse anyone still sleeping inside. Still no answer. He used his key to unlock the front door and went inside. Mary stayed on the porch. Ross only went to one room off of the parlor, which was the downstairs bedroom. When he opened the door, he saw two bodies in bed with very large pools of blood soaked through their bedclothes. They were the bodies of Lena and Ina Stillinger. He returned to the porch and told Mary to call the sheriff. City Marshal Hank Horton arrived shortly thereafter, only to check the house and find that all six members of the Moore family, along with the two Stillinger girls, had been brutally murdered. Their skulls were crushed by an axe. All eight people were still in their beds, attacked in their sleep. Joe Moore, age 43. Sarah Moore, age 39. Herman Moore, age 11. Catherine Moore, age 9. Boyd Moore, age 7. Paul Moore, age 5. Lena Stillinger, age 12, and Ina Stillinger, age 8. Lena Stillinger had apparently awakened and fought back because she had some defensive wounds. Although her bedclothes were raised above her waist and she had no undergarments, there was no sign of sexual assault. All the victims' faces had been covered with bedclothes. One kerosene lamp, obviously disturbed and missing its chimney, was found near Joe Moore's body. Another lamp was also found, also missing its chimney near the Stillinger children. There were deep gouge marks in the ceiling in the parents' room above the bed and in the children's room from the upswing of the axe. The axe belonged to Joe Moore and was found near the Stillinger girls' bodies. It had been hastily wiped, but blood still remained. All doors were found to still be locked. There was a part of a keychain found in the downstairs bedroom. Among the most bizarre evidence found at the crime scene, a slab of bacon wrapped in a dish towel left near the axe. Investigators also found a pan of bloody water and a plate of uneaten food left on the kitchen table. Word of this horrific scene spread quickly through the small, close-knit town. People showed up in droves to gawk at the scene. Law enforcement could not contain the crowd. It's estimated that well over a hundred people went tromping through the Moore house, looking at the grisly, mangled bodies and handling the bloody items. The Villisca National Guard finally showed up around noon 
and cordoned off the area. The crime scene was finally secured. Over the next several weeks and months, the residents of Villisca began buying up guns, keeping watch at night in shifts, and replacing locks. They eyed their neighbors suspiciously, and everyone was considered a suspect. The suspicions led to strained and even terminated relationships throughout the community. But who could have committed such a horrific crime in this idyllic little town? At the time, fingerprinting was in its infancy and DNA testing was a far off forensic dream. A local druggist had even showed up with a camera to photograph the scene but was turned away immediately. The importance of crime scene photos had not yet been realized. However, bloodhounds were sent out on June 11th. They tracked the scent down to the nearby Nataway River, where they lost the trail. So were there any suspects then? From the very first day, several suspects came under intense scrutiny. The biggest and most obvious suspect was none other than state senator and former employer of Joe Moore, Frank Jones. Jones had plenty of motives, and everyone knew it. Rumors flew that if he didn't commit the murders himself, did he pay someone to do it? No formal charges were ever brought against him. But the crime did not go unnoticed outside of Villisca either. A Texas land agent and undercover agent for Burns Detective Agency in Kansas City, Detective James Wilkerson, had studied the case from the beginning because it closely resembled a case he had worked on in Kansas. He would become a voice in the investigation. When suspicions flew throughout the community, they first started blaming the crimes on transients and strangers. One such person, a Burlington Railroad worker named Andy Sawyer, was accused. His employer reported him to the authorities because he had some very peculiar habits. He slept with an axe and had an intense interest in the murders. The town sheriff detained Sawyer, but ultimately released him when it was discovered that he had been arrested for vagrancy in Osceola, Iowa, the night of the murders. Henry Moore, no relation to the victims, was a man who killed his mother and grandmother with an axe months after the Villisca murders. He was tried and convicted of killing his mother and grandmother and sentenced to life in prison. In May 1913, a federal investigator claimed he had solved the Villisca murders and 22 other axe murders across the country by blaming Henry Moore. Henry Moore was never officially charged with those claims. He did, however, serve 36 years of his sentence and was paroled in 1949. Sam Moyer was Joe Moore's brother-in-law. He had often threatened to kill Moore, but also had an alibi the night of the murders. He was discarded as a suspect. The visiting preacher at the Presbyterian Church the night of the Children's Day service, Reverend George Kelly, was also a suspect. He and his wife skipped town at 5.30 a.m., the morning after the murders. Kelly was informally described as a pervert. He had suffered a supposed mental breakdown as a teenager. He was ultimately arrested in 1914 for sending obscene materials through the mail. A woman had applied for a job he had posted for a secretary. He insisted that she work without clothes, which prompted her to tell the authorities. Kelly was convicted and in lieu of jail, he was sent to the St. Elizabeth Hospital, a mental health facility in Washington, D.C., In 1917, he was arrested for the Villisca killings. Under extreme duress and hours of intense interrogation, he confessed to the police. He later recanted his confession. The first trial ended in a hung jury. The second trial ended with his acquittal. William Blackie Mansfield was a suspected serial killer accused of killing his wife, child, in-laws, and similar axe murders in Powell, Kansas. Detective Wilkerson accused Frank Jones of hiring Mansfield to execute the Moore family. Wilkerson even suggested that Mansfield was a cocaine-addicted serial killer himself. 
Wilkerson convinced a grand jury to investigate Mansfield in 1916. The irony was that Mansfield had a solid alibi the night of the murders, and the charges were dropped. Mansfield then sued Wilkerson for defamation and was awarded more than $2,000. An immigrant, possibly from Germany, named Paul Mueller, was a suspect of a year-long manhunt for the murder of a family in West Brookfield, Massachusetts, in 1897. He was the subject of a 2019 book by Bill James and his daughter Rachel McCarthy James, called The Man from the Train. In the book, the Jameses compared crime scenes from about 60 unsolved murders over 10 or so years in 14 separate incidents that included Colorado Springs, Colorado, Howla, Kansas, and Villisca, Iowa. The serial killer selected families that lived near railroad tracks, which is how he traveled. He struck around midnight and used the blunt side of an axe. There were many more similarities between Villisca and the other crime scenes. But through all the leads generated and all the suspects questioned, the Villisca axe murders are still unsolved to this day. And so it goes. The dark cloud of that 1912 grizzly axe murder still looms heavy on the once idyllic picturesque town of Villisca. Western Canada's Highway 16 weaves through rugged, frigid forests to connect the British Columbian cities of Prince Rupert and Prince George. This stretch of road is better known as the Highway of Tears, a nickname that hardly came by accident. It's not only the eeriest road in the entire country, It's also the last road many people have ever traveled. The Highway of Tears is a 450 mile stretch within Highway 16. It became famous for the number of people who have been murdered or gone missing there. According to official sources, the highway has claimed 20 victims, but that's not the full story. Some have suggested that the actual number of lives lost is twice that, and others say that it actually could be in the hundreds. The route was given its grim moniker during a vigil for victims held in Terrace, British Columbia in 1998 by a woman named Florence Nasiel. Nasiel was thinking of the grieving families of the victims, crying over their lost loved ones. The remains of many victims have been discovered along the highway throughout the decades. In 1974, the body of Monica Ignace was found strangled and stabbed in an abandoned car. In 1981, Roswitha Fuchsbickler was mangled and mutilated. Therese Humphrey was found naked and half frozen in a snowbank in 1993. What exactly is happening along this particular corridor, and who is killing all of these people? Some important considerations start with the highway covering a major industrial route and getting plenty of daily traffic. The majority of the victims were women, and many who disappeared were prostitutes a job that historically is vulnerable to murderers. Secondly, many of the people using the highway were not local and thus would not be recognized. Finally, large stretches of the route are also deserted, meaning there's less chances for a witness or better yet, a good Samaritan. There are 23 First Nations locales near the Highway of Tears, and these indigenous communities have suffered the worst losses. This 
perhaps is the core of the problem. Furthermore, the government has downplayed the actual number of victims to the public, both missing and dead. The Royal Canadian Mounted Police began investigating the Highway of Tears in 1981. They started this with the so-called Highway Murders Initiative. This was supposedly their plan to get to the bottom of this tragedy and clean up the area, but the streak of murders and mysterious disappearances continued on, despite the investigation. The police also started another effort called Project E. Panna in 2005 under their Unsolved Homicide Unit. The project was named after the Inuit word for the spirit goddess who guides souls into the afterlife. A morbid name for a morbid subject. Perhaps the eeriest thing about the Highway of Tears is that the vast majority of the murders are never solved. And so the killers might still be walking around free to this day. It's as if these victims, on the other hand, essentially just vanished into thin air. Many believe most of the disappearances are just murders where the body was never found. Fortunately, over the years, a few of the cases have been solved. Colleen McMillan left her house in 1974 to go visit a friend. Her remains were found by the highway a month later. And DNA evidence helped convict serial killer Bobby Jack Fowler as the murderer in that case. He died six years prior, however, there was some justice done at least. Fowler happens to be a suspect in a few other Highway of Tears cases as well. In 2014, E. Panna Investigations and the Unsolved Homicide Unit charged Gary Taylor Handlin with murder. Evidence linked him to the killing of 12-year-old Monica Jack in 1978. 41 years later, Handlin was finally found guilty by a jury and sentenced to life in prison in 2019. He was the first killer in Project E. Panna to go through full court proceedings and sentencing. Sadly, however, Highway of Tears cases with such outcomes are the exception. Many cannot technically be counted as murders due to the lack of a body. Francis Brown hasn't been seen since October 14th, 2017, after she had gone out mushroom picking in the mountainous terrain that adorns the highway. Four days later, the police called off their intense search efforts for her which consisted of 19 different search and rescue crews from all over the province, along with local volunteers. It was the largest search operation undertaken on the highway. In Brown's case, the only thing they found was evidence of a campfire. Heavy rain and snow made it difficult to find any other trace of her. However, it's unlikely that Frances just got lost. She was raised by a trapper and was an experienced backcountry explorer herself. She had been picking mushrooms for decades. Not only that, but she was fully prepared with weather-appropriate clothing, boots, and a lighter. Her murderer is almost certainly out there somewhere. So, why Highway 16? Many people have pointed out over the years that the area has very little public transportation coupled with low rates of car ownership. This means that for a lot of people living in nearby indigenous communities, hitchhiking appears to be an option, if not the only option to get around town. These days, 
There are signs posted along the highway that specifically warn women against hitchhiking. The fact that people have continued to go missing for decades with relatively little progress in identifying the culprits might indicate something sinister or woeful about the area. Not only is it so impoverished that many people can't afford cars, but it has been plagued with widespread drug abuse and domestic violence issues. Some people more broadly note that these indigenous communities have also been disconnected from their traditional culture and that their family units have been historically disrupted by the government's foster care and school systems. Some family members of the victims claim that the Canadian government and the Royal Mounted Police continue to ignore the problem. Indigenous communities in particular have spoken out against what they see as unfair treatment, that the police just don't take these cases as seriously as they do the other ones. In all, one belief must certainly prevail. Will this haunting highway continue to claim a community's suffering and even more souls? Only time and tears will tell. Long before serial killers became a grim staple of modern crime, the city of New Orleans was terrorized by a mysterious killer who haunted its citizens for two harrowing years and was never identified. New Orleans is a city of diversity, inhabited by immigrants from all over the world. In 1918, a community of Italians became the target of a sinister figure who indulged in nearly a dozen grisly attacks on hapless victims between May of that year and October of 1919. His signature act was to use axes owned by the victims as the instruments of death. The crimes were sensationalized by the press, and because most of the targets were Italian immigrants, some speculated that the horrifying attacks were ethnically motivated and may have even involved the mafia. But there's no evidence to support this claim. Others suggest the killer was primarily interested in female victims, in several cases, only the female victim was killed, while their husbands or partners survived. It was thought that men may have been attacked only when they tried to intervene and save the women. The monstrous crime spree began on May 23, 1918, when an Italian grocer and his wife were attacked in their sleep in their apartment. The Axeman broke into the home of Joseph and Catherine Maggio and slit their throats with a straight razor and bashed in their heads with an axe. Catherine's head was nearly severed from her body while Joseph survived for two hours, long enough to be found alive by his two brothers. He died only minutes after being found. The brothers had heard strange sounds coming from the apartment, which drew them to investigate. Later, a message was found written on the pavement in front of their apartment. Mrs. Maggio will sit up tonight, just like Mrs. Tony referring to the murder of another Italian grocer, dating back to 1911. Police suspected it might be the same killer. The crime was not a robbery, because no money or property was stolen. Police thought it was strange that one of the brothers, Andrew, who lived in the building, had not heard the intruder when he broke in and committed the murders. He claimed he was inebriated after a night of raucous drinking. He also reported seeing a suspicious character lurking near the apartment before the attacks. Only a month later, a bakery wagon driver conducting early morning deliveries discovered the ravaged bodies of Louis Bessemer and his mistress Harriet Lowe lying in a pool of blood. Bessemer's right temple had been sliced open with a hatchet, and Harriet's left ear had been meticulously carved off of her head. An axe belonging to Louis Bessemer was discovered in their bathroom. They had been attacked in their sleep. Harriet Lowe was still alive and taken to the hospital. After Lowe reported being attacked by a black man, 
that resident was arrested and detained, but he was quickly released due to lack of evidence. Feeding off of the sensational story, the press took aim at Bessemer himself when letters he had written in German, Yiddish, and Russian were found in a trunk in his house. Police suspected him of being a German spy, and Harriet, on the brink of death in the hospital, confirmed their suspicions. Bessemer was immediately arrested, only to be released just two days later due to poor detective work. Later, Harriet claimed Bessemer had attacked her with a hatchet a month earlier. Bessemer was charged with murder, but a media circus surrounded Harriet, whose accusations became increasingly unreliable. Bessemer served only nine months in prison after Harriet's scandalous statements proved baseless. Two months after the attack, Harriet died following a failed operation to repair her partially disfigured face. Before she died, she told authorities that she suspected it was Bessemer who attacked her. Later that same month, Anna Schneider, who was eight months pregnant, awoke one night to see a dark figure looming over her bed. She was repeatedly struck on the face, her scalp was cut open, and her husband found her later that night covered in blood. She survived and gave birth only two days later. A table lamp was deemed the likely instrument of the attack. An ex-convict named James Gleason was arrested, but like the others, he was released due to lack of evidence. Meanwhile, the police suspected that Anna's assailant was the same man responsible for the assault on Bessemer and Harriet Lowe. Only five days later, two young sisters, Pauline and Mary Bruno, were awakened by a disturbance in the next room. There they found their uncle, Joseph Romano, with two massive cuts on his head from a violent blow. The girls saw the attacker racing from the scene, a dark-skinned, heavy-set man in a dark suit and a droopy hat. Romano died two days later of head trauma. Investigators found a panel in the back of the home, chiseled away along with a bloody axe that was spotted in the backyard. This latest incident sparked a wave of fear and panic across New Orleans. The city was being terrorized by a serial killer. Police received numerous reports of Axeman sightings or axes mysteriously appearing in backyards. One detective speculated that the killer had a split personality and likened him to Dr. Jackal and Mr. Hyde. Another Italian immigrant family was targeted in March of 1919, when screams of horror were heard coming from the home of Charles and Rosie Cortemiglia. A nearby grocer investigated and found both of them and their daughter Mary covered in blood. Charles was flat on the floor and Rosie stood in the doorway bleeding from the head and holding her dead daughter, who had been killed with a chop to the back of the neck. A panel on the back door of their home had been chiseled away to gain entry, and a bloody axe was discovered on the back porch. Both parents survived. Rosie accused Orlando Giordano and his 18-year-old son of the crime, even though the father was a frail 69-year-old man and the son was too big to fit through the back door panel. They were arrested, found guilty, and the father was sentenced to hang. But a year later, Rosie admitted she made a false accusation, and the two suspects were freed. Shortly after this attack, a letter allegedly written by the Axeman was made public. In it, he bragged that he would never be caught, that he was invisible, and that he was not human but a demon from hell. He claimed a close relationship with the angel of death, and he appeared to delight in terrifying the people of New Orleans. He proudly promised he could kill thousands if he wanted, but strangely, he would spare those who were playing jazz music at the time of his attacks. In response, citizens speculated that a jazz club owner might be trying to promote jazz music with a series of vicious murders In August of 1919, yet another grocer, Steve Boca, was awakened one night by a dark figure hovering over him and was suddenly struck unconscious by a blow to the head with an axe. He regained consciousness and discovered his head was cracked open. He survived the attack, 
but remembered nothing about his attacker. The last two Axeman attacks happened in the early fall of 1919. The killer entered the apartment of 19-year-old Sarah Lawman through an open window and delivered a violent blow to her head, knocking out several teeth. A bloody axe was found on the front lawn of her building. And the final victim, Mike Pepitone, was found dead by his wife in their bedroom, struck in the head with blood spattered about the room, and the attacker fleeing into the night. To this day, there are only theories about who the mysterious Axeman of New Orleans really was. Though suspects were repeatedly named and arrested, none of them proved to be the killer. Accounts of the crimes were often unreliable, and even the culprits suggested by early crime historians based on news articles of the day have turned out to be people whose mere existence has been contested. Perhaps this is why the story of this early serial killer has captivated the curious for more than 100 years. My name is Scott, and thank you so much for watching. We are Mystery Syndicate. If you like what we do, please consider subscribing to our YouTube channel. Leave a comment and give this video a like. And to be notified when we post new videos, hit that notification bell. Also, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Patreon. And for exclusive merchandise, visit our website at www.mysterysyndicate.com. From all of us at Mystery Syndicate, thank you again. We sincerely appreciate your support.